Okay, so we are recording uh, and I'll hand things over um, to group nine. Thank you, Dr. Drum. So we are the Diana Seekers and our design is a Lunar Reconnaissance 12U CubeSat canisterized satellite dispenser, which we'll be referencing as CSD throughout the presentation. Our product is Diana One and we are group nine. I'm Christina Sanders. I'm Jacob Gorder. I'm Carrie Lau. Ricardo Martinez. Nicholas Weber. Sorry about that. Um, my Zoom froze, Jacob McCann. <laughs> Next, we'll begin our presentation outline. Throughout this presentation, we'll be covering a couple different topics. Our head talk concept, our product overview with a detailed subsystem analysis, a cost breakdown, and a manufacturing breakdown. As a head talk concept, the Diana Seekers aim to create an innovative and sustainable CSD in order to enable human expansion throughout the solar system, starting with lunar expansion in an unforeseen way from before. By fostering the specialized talents and experiences through internships, research, and different job opportunities, the Diana Seekers aim to support and catalyze the American economic growth. With all of our diverse backgrounds from each individual member, a new perspective is derived to drive the project in a new specialized way. Our goals are to show our passion, economic viability, and show what we are the best at for our company. Our design leverages classical mechanics to achieve optimal operation. The design is simply a rectangular prism with triangular ridges extruded from the walls. These ridges supply structural rigidity and vibrational damping to the system. We intend to use the 3D printable material Z-Peak to manufacture the walls and the exit door. Z-Peak is lighter than its well-known counterparts, aluminum and titanium. It is incredibly strong and resistant to vibrational loads. The canisterized satellite dispenser is quite light weighing roughly 3.9 kilograms and standing at 39.5 centimeters tall with a length and width of 26.25 centimeters and an internal volume of roughly 22 cubic centimeters. As for the ejection process, the door is opened using two torsion springs that sit on a hinge which is free to rotate. A singular spring will be used to thrust the CSD, the CubeSat out of the CSD which is guided by the interior rail system. During the journey to space, two solenoid locks lock the door into place, securing the CubeSat inside. A limit switch sits flush against the door and alerts the team when the injection process has taken place. I believe your screen froze again. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. My screen keeps freezing. Um, to achieve this design, we determined five subsystems that were integral to mission success and customer satisfaction. Vehicle mounting, launching, dispensing, communication power, stability, and protection. So the first subsystem is the vehicle mounting. Uh, we're using a mounting bracket frame. Uh, as you can see here, it's on the uh, corners of the CSD. This allows for a bolted connection to the vehicle platform. Uh, some of the holes will be used for the actual connection with bolts. Others are used to decrease the overall mass of the CSD. Um, this, model, or this design ensures compatibility between the CSD and the launch vehicle. And it is over, it's, the material is the Z-Peak material. Some of the customer needs um, that were satisfied by the subsystem were the launch vehicle capability, the structural load, the shock load, the center of gravity requirements, and the connection plane. Um, this had to be able to withstand 7.5 Gs of axial loading and 2 Gs of lateral loading, as well as a shock response of 4 Gs. Um, this model that we came up with scored the highest among group members when it came to compatibility and the capability in attaching to the launch vehicle platform itself. 
The tensile strength can withstand the lateral and axial loads as it has about 100 meg megapascals of tensile strength. Um, Z-Peak is a shock absorbing and vibration absorbing material, which is really good. This model has an extremely low center of gravity relative to the launch vehicle platform as it is simply a bolted connection. Um, so it is also symmetrical, which is really good for our center of gravity, our geometry, um, and the connection to the launch vehicle. And we use 30 fasteners, which will be shown in the next two slides. To ensure the back panel remains securely fastened onto the CSD, the bolt's thickness of an 18-8 steel hex head bolt was calculated. Knowing that the measured diameter of the bolt the grip length between the washer faces and the bolt length, the bolt stiffness can be calculated by first finding the length of the threaded part. Once finding the threaded length, the shank length of the bolt and the length of the threaded part within the grip was calculated. Plugging into the bolt stiffest equation with a known cross-sectional area and tensile area strength, the bolt stiffest was determined to be 5.54 times 10 to the eight newtons per meter. A high bolt stiffness is desirable because a CSD will experience shock loads up to four Gs during liftoff. A strong bolt will ensure all bolted components stay on during the flight. The high bolt stiffness serves to protect the mounting from fa failure as there will be high stress concentrations located at the holes. The launching dispensing subsystem is integral to mission success. There are more than a dozen parts that must work together to safely eject the CubeSat. To understand this process, we will split it up into a two-system process. The first of which is the force application. The force application <clears throat> utilizes the following components, which are shown on the right. The bottom CSD face, the spring, and the pusher plate. These three metal pieces are welded together and are all manufactured from aluminum 6061. The bottom face fastens to the CSD walls via high strength steel hex head bolts, securing the spring. Uh oh, did we just lose Jacob? This is the CubeSat. I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, Jacob, you, you froze there for about 15 seconds, so you, you might go back uh, okay, okay. and restate, restate the last few sentences. Yes, so I'll start from the beginning. The launch and dispensing subsystem is, uh, is integral to mission success. To understand the subsystem, we will split it up into a two system process, the force application and the unobstructed trajectory. The force application includes the bottom CSD face, the spring and the pusher plate. These three metal pieces are welded together and all manufactured from aluminum 6061. The bottom face fastened to the CSD walls via high strength steel hex head bolts, securing the spring and pusher plate in place. The pusher plate is used to evenly distribute the spring force across the CubeSat and protect it from the force of the spring. The second system shepherds the ejection of the CubeSat is the creation of an unobstructed exit way. This system will open the door using an electric signal that <clears throat> tells the solenoids to retract and allowing the door to freely rotate open with the torsion springs. The torsional springs also prevent the momentum of the door from bouncing off the CSD and hitting the CubeSat on its way out. The rails inside the CSD walls help to put the CubeSat on the right trajectory. The launch and dispensing mechanism accounts for three customer needs. The way needs to be present and there must be a prototype that can be made within a $500 budget. Real quick, Jacob, uh, do you mind restating that one real quick? Sorry about that. Yeah, of course. I'm really sorry about this, by the way. Um, 
So the three customer needs that the launching dispensing mechanism covers is the area of the opening, the So this subsystem has to cover um, door reliability, the CubeSat initial velocity or exit velocity and our prototype cost were the three big burdens on this subsystem. Um, the Obviously we wanted the door to be big enough so that the CubeSat could um, fit through. We needed between 0.5 and two meters per second of exit velocity and our prototype had to be under five meters per second. Um, we were able to achieve the unobstructed exit with the um, springs that mitigate the risk of the door bouncing back and hitting the CubeSat on its way out. Um, we're going to go next into our velocity that we found and our material cost was within that $500 budget. Um, I'm going to try one more time. Uh, I'm going to take my video off. Hopefully that helps. So a kinematic analysis of the launching dispensing mechanism was performed to determine the acceptable range of forces that the spring could propagate to eject the CubeSat at the desired speed. To determine the range of force that our spring could apply to the CubeSat, we use the kinematic equations and Newton's second law. The force at these two velocities, 0 0.5 meters per second and 2.0 meters per second, were found by calculating the acceleration at the exit of the CSD and then using Newton's second law to determine the force. It was found that the minimum spring force needed to generate a 0 0.5 meters per second velocity was around 8.8 .8 Newtons and that the spring could not generate a force greater than 141.2 Newtons. Diana 1 leverages an aluminum 6061 spring which compresses 28 centimeters down to a height of four centimeters, which propagates a force of 27 Newtons. This force ejects the CubeSat at 0. At 0 0.786 meters per second, which is within our 0.5 to two meters per second range. During operation, the CSD door must be able to withstand the difference between internal and external pressures. Using the launch payload user guide provided by Rocket Labs and assuming that there is a slow outgassing process, the maximum pressure that the CSD will experience will be no more than atmospheric pressure. Assuming that the CSD acts like a thin wall pressure vessel, the hoop and longitudinal stresses can be calculated where P is the maximum pressure, R is the radius, and T is the thickness. Since the CSD is a rectangular shape, the maximum inner wall distance will be treated as the radius. Z-Peak should be able to withstand the change in pressure experienced during the launch due to its high tensile strength. As seen in Zortax's data sheet, Z-Peak has a tensile strength of approximately 100 MPa, which is much higher than the calculated hoop and longitudinal stresses. There is sufficient room for the consideration of stress concentrations and pressure changes during liftoff. Further exploring the launcher door mechanism, the CubeSat rail interface will be analyzed. A research team at Indian Institute of Technology conducted a series of pin-on-disc desk pin -disc tests at 45 degrees with a peak pin pressed onto steel disc, manufactured by polishing, turning, milling, and grill blasting. The wear patterns and contact surfaces were measured and observed under a microscope. As seen in the left figure, the grill blasted and polished discs had peak deposits on the metal while the turned and milled were relatively unscathed. Examining the frictional response on the right, all four methods were relatively stable after reaching a sliding distance of 450 meters. Friction on the turned surface remained nearly constant under atmospheric and vacuum environments. In vacuum conditions, polished surfaces achieved the lowest wear and friction. Grid blasted surfaces led to the highest wear and friction in both atmospheric and vacuum pressures, pressure and vacuumed environments. Assuming that the CubeSat uses polished aluminum 6061 metal, the coefficient of friction between the CubeSat and the rails will be approximately 0 0.4.
Reliable communication and power is essential for a successful mission. That's why we decided to use a DB9 socket connector to handle all data transfer and the 28 volts provided by the launch vehicle. The components that will be plugged into this connector are a limit switch, which will initiate the launch protocol of the CubeSat, a grounding wire, and two solenoids. This will only use seven of the nine connection points, allowing for design changes in the future, depending on changes in launch vehicles. Customer needs that need to be achieved are uh, the shock hazard of less than 0.1 ohm and electrical charge of one ohm, which will be satisfied by resistors and our grounding wire. Um, it'll be able a nine or a DB9 connector will be able to handle the 28 volts provided as well as communicate data and information with the launch vehicle. Um, the quincentent mode will allow our CubeSat and CSD to be dormant for up to 12 months and we'll be able to power on and off at will depending on what stage of the mission the CubeSat is in. The electrical schematic for the CSD in the close and open position are shown. The minimum current needed to run one of the locks can be calculated using Ohm's law. Substituting the values found in the motor spec sheet, the minimum current needed to run the solenoids are 300 milliamps. Using the maximum available voltage supplied by the launch vehicle, which is 28 volts, and assuming a germanium diode to assist the flow of current in the solenoid, the maximum current available is calculated to be 682.5 milliamps. Since the launch vehicle supports more current than is needed by the solenoid locks, they will function. To ensure reliability of the solenoids being able to open the door at the same time, testing would need to be done. Now moving on to the stability subsystem, um, it consists mainly of the CSD casing. So the stability subsystem is the one that underwent the most changes in the design process. At first, the casing was simply just a rectangular prism, and over time, we decided to add more features, such as an access panel and triangular supports. It was determined that the triangular supports would add strength, improve damping, and increase structural and um, integrity and rigidity. One of the biggest changes that was made to this subsystem was a change in material from aluminum to Z-Peak. The Z-Peak significantly decreased the mass of the casing and helped us achieve the, desire, the desired customer need for mass. Speaking of customer needs, the customer needs achieved by the stability subsystem include the acoustic loads, the vibration, the mass, and the payload capacity. The CSD casing can support up to 144.7 micropascals in acoustic loads, it also has a natural frequency far larger than the 50 hertz, which is experienced during launch. The subsystem also stays far below the five kilogram mass requirement, which is helpful in providing more available mass for other subsystems. It can also house the 112U CubeSat needed for launch. Uh, the way the subsystem achieves this is through the insulating material, damping material, and the lighting material, which is provided by the Z-Peak. It also has the proper interior volume to How's the cube set? So in reference with the triangular extrusions that were just previously mentioned, first we want to do a little analysis to talk about our earlier design when we did not include these extrusions. So doing those extrusions, removing them without them, we have a mass of about 1.5 kilograms and Doing so, we were able to find that mass by taking the product of the material density and the volume of the material used to construct it. As stated on the note on the slide, since we are talking about the previous design without the extrusions, currently that last term in our volume would be zero. So using the Young's modulus area and length for the walls, we were able to calculate the stiffness to be about 1.3 times 10 to the 13 Newton meters, which is a wonderful stiffness uh, however, you will see later on that with our extrusions, we are able to get a little bit stronger and support our system a little bit more. 
Uh, but the natural frequency was found to be about three times 10 to the six radians per seconds, which is much larger than our natural frequency of 50 hertz that we'll be experiencing during launch. Now talking about with the extrusions, our mass does get up a little higher. It is about 1.6 kilograms now. However, when you look over at our stiffness, we have increased to be about 1.36 times 10 to 13 Newton meters, meaning that the addition of the triangular extrusions added on some stiffness and some protection for our CubeSat inside so that during launch, it won't be experiencing as much of the vibroacoustic loads as it would without the extrusions. And as our main goal of the entire mission is to safely execute the launch procedure, we want to ensure that our CubeSat makes it up into space first to be able to conduct that procedure. And same with the natural frequency of with the extrusions, we are still way over the experienced 50 Hertz. So we are safe to conduct our mission. So for the protection subsystem, um, we are gonna be using a gold coloring on the outside of the CubeSat, which will mitigate a lot of the temperature and radiation that um, could affect the CubeSat and the CSD. Otherwise, we also have gaskets to keep seals on our access panel uh, in order to ensure that there's no contamination inside of the CSD. Some of the customer needs achieved by the subsystem were the thermal environment, the liftoff and ascent, the mission duration, the contamination protection, the orbital contamination, and the uh, production cost. For a thermal environment, that gold coating does mitigate a lot of the temperature that will be experienced by the CubeSat through the CSD. Um, the primary source of thermal uh, or of uh, temperature changes is going to be through radiation, which that, like I said, that coating will reflect a lot of. Um, during liftoff and ascent, we're using venting to ensure that the pressure differential inside the CSD is not too extreme for the CubeSat. Uh, our mission duration, it, it had to be at least 14 days, and our material will not degrade over those 14 days. Uh, for contam contamination during storage and prior to launch, uh, we have gaskets to seal any moisture uh, or in order to ensure that no moisture will get inside the CSD. For orbital contamination, we were uh, ready for one millimeter size particles after the launch. Uh, and our outgassing process will ensure that no orbital contamination will affect the CS or the CubeSat launch from the CSD. And we are well within our production cost, which had to be less than or equal to $500,000 as we are using a lot of off the shelf parts. So as stated, the final design includes a thermally protective paint throughout the entire exterior of the CSD casing. So the material was determined to be made out of a silica glass as that would be the most effective for our purposes. And this analysis is just going to prove that having the addition of that coating doesn't add on too much weight. So as we're going through, we're calculating the mass, which was determined by ensuring that we don't wanna go over in that excess weight. So we multiplied the density by the volume in order to see that the extra coating would only add on 0 0.03 kilograms in mass, which is expected. We did not expect there to be a large difference. However, when we are within a strict tight five kilogram mass aspect, everything must be considered to ensure that we are not adding on excessive weight that's not needed. So we have proven that the coating is more beneficial than the slight amount of weight that it provides. As stated, the radiation is the main source of heat transfer that is observed in space. So to achieve the desired CubeSat and CSD protection, the CSD must be able to withstand and or reflect a certain amount of radiation. This was determined by using the emissivity coefficient, the average temperature in space, the maximum average temperature that we'll see our material experience and the Stefan Boltzmann constant. So as we're using this coating, we're expecting there to be a large amount of radiation that's gonna be reflected off our CSD. The radiation was calculated using the equation shown on the screen, and we were able to determine that about 631 watts per meter squared is going to be able to be reflected off of our casing. So we'll be able to protect our CubeSat as well as our CSD 
from large amounts of radiation during our mission. All right, so how much is this going to cost? cost? We'll start we'll with the 3D printing, printing, printing manufacturing. manufacturing. Um, um, oh, using the equation on the right, right. Uh, right. Uh, Nicholas, can I stop you there for a second? We're, we're getting that same uh, robot voice effect that we've had in the past. Okay. okay. Um, I have it ready to go to a demo video here. You've you've been able to work around it in the past. I'm not sure how, but yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. While he's doing that, I can start to go over the slide a little bit and just start to give us a little bit of a rundown. So our cost breakdown, our main source is going to be three D printing manufacturing. So within our equation, we are including the material used, the print time and the print energy. So while we're going through, our print energy is about 0.15 kilowatts per hour, and the energy cost is about 15 cents per kilowatt. So what we're doing is our main source of manufacturing is our 3D printing, and that is so that we can have a cheaper manufacturing cost when compared to traditional methods, whereas it would be taking a giant chunk of aluminum and milling that down as seen by competitors. All right, is my audio working now? Yes. All right, cool. Um, all right, so <clears throat> for our manufactured parts, we only have two machine manufactured parts, which will come out to a subtotal of about $40. Um, and then shown below that, we have our final print product using Z-Peak and the Z-Peak support material. And that comes out to $1,613. And then our prototype using PLA uh, will have a part cost, a total part cost of $63.65. Uh, since most of our parts will be um, off the shelf parts, uh, the final prototype will cost $2,518 in uh, ordered parts. This does include the 3D print rolls, as well as the prototype costing $255, uh, including those print rolls. Um, and for each of our manufacturers, we set out five different parameters that they must um, have and or they must satisfy four of the five parameters that we've set out. Those being uh, the manufacturers must have notable partners, associates and customers, uh, a congruent web page dedicated to the product, realistic price ranges compared to competing products a minimum five years of company operation and detailed technical information of the product. And the total cost breakdown, um, the material parts to order, not including the 3D print materials is $395. Machine parts coming out to $39.16. Uh, Printed parts, uh, including the this is where the uh, print material is included, will be $2,382. And this includes extra print material, expecting there'll be some mishaps with the 3D printing, and we won't have to buy excess material and wait for that to be shipped out. The prototype will cost a total of $258.61. And then each designer will be paid on a salary basis for six months of $40,000 for a grand total of $243,076. Now on to the uh, manufacturing breakdown. So one of the advantages of our product is that manufacturing is minimal since most parts are off the shelf and 3D printed. 
We do have some aluminum parts. However, they are simple and they are based off of aluminum sheets. Our manufacturing time is 173 hours and most of that consists mainly of the printing time. The assembly time is also minimal at about 25 minutes. And then this is a quick video showing the overall layout of the CSD. It's going to kind of cut through and you kind of, you'll kind of see when it starts. But once the top is gone, this is what the inside of our CSD is going to look like with this being the kind of final result. This kind of just goes to show the overall layout of the inside in reference to the outside of the CSD itself. And with that, this concludes our presentation of our product, Diana One. The Diana Seekers would like to personally thank all of you for attending our presentation today, and we are open for questions. All right, awesome. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just for um, sake of, of time, there's a um, departmental event that's uh, about 15 minutes from now. So I wanted to give Dr. S uh, the first chance to ask questions if she wants to. Sure, thanks, Matt. You guys gave a great presentation and there was some really good analysis there. I did have a couple questions and I might've missed some of the part points, but uh, I know those are vibration with launch. Did you take that into account in your kind of like um, a bolt analysis in any way? Oh, so for so our manufacturing, uh, sorry. So for our manufacturing, we will be using um, Loctite in order to ensure that or to mitigate as much of the, um, if not all of the vibration during launch in order to ensure that the bolts don't essentially vibrate out of spit or out of uh, place and lose any tightness. I love it. And also like given like some of the new design, like the materials and the coatings, um, what do you see as the most critical feasibility kind of tests that you would do um, to determine whether this is a, a good design, a, a viable design going forward? Like, is there something that you feel like uh, that's kind of new that you need to test? For testing purposes, one thing in particular that we really want to address that we did address like about testing is the solenoids. So the solenoid locks, as they go, there's two of them and they will lock and hold our door in place. However, we have plans to conduct testing in our budget as to ensure and address that both the solenoids will move at the same time or move sim simultaneously and that the electrical system will be able to handle giving enough power to have them move. That's that's a good test. And then I had one question. So to me, it seemed like kind of like a jack in the box, right? Like you have like a release and it comes out. So is there the possibility that the release of the lid will affect the trajectory, like the direction that the lid's released in will change the directory of your, your satellite? So I can cover this. So we have rails inside in order to ensure that we understand that the CubeSat will be pressing against the top, but those rails, once the uh, top is cleared and it's kind of covered by those springs that avoid any rebound effect from the door, those rails will kind of take over and ensure that the trajectory is on a uh, correct path. And then one, one last question, because you guys were so clear, I had so many questions. Um, did you account for the stress of the spring on your on the satellite itself while it's sitting in there? Yes, as our uh, material is made out of aluminum, the stress that it'll be applying forward will not be large enough to actually cause any damage onto our uh, CubeSat. Very good. Those are all my questions, Matt. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, any questions from our other panelists? We've had um, actually almost the entire teaching team popped in here, um, so we've got uh, Sydney, Jeremy, and April. Uh, I've got a couple questions. I hopped in a little late. Um, where exactly are you including the 3D printed parts? Is that your entire body? Okay. 
Um, I was having a couple concerns based on print orientation. Did you take into consideration the orientation of the print surfaces in your stress? Because if you're layering like this and your force is applied this way, it's going to shear a lot faster than if you're doing this and you're going that way. Um, we did run each 3D printed part through Pure Slicer to determine the print time, print material. And due to the strength of ZPeak, we optimized uh, print time and print cost since it's a very expensive material. Okay, um, I would definitely take a look into print orientation because you do have so much wiggle room. I think the main thing here would just be making sure that the orientation of the print is able to withstand the forces because it can be very different based on what orientation your print is in. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, other panelist questions? Hey guys, uh, great presentation. Um, I had a couple questions though. Um, I was wondering, could we take a look again real quick at uh, your cost breakdown slide? I think I had a few of them. This yes, the overall cost breakdown or what's shown here now? Um, I may have missed it, but did you guys touch on um, actual, um, besides manufacturing uh, materials costs and that sort of thing, did you talk about labor costs or anything, um, outsourcing or anything specific not relating directly to manufacturing of parts? The labor cost is factored into the machine uh, manufactured parts uh, that to calculate the price for that using $21 an hour uh, for a machinist going rate. Um, <clears throat> and I believe it is the two, the two gas or access panel brackets each take 45 minutes to make. And then it takes 25 minutes for uh, the hinge to be cut to the right shape. So that's calculated in with that um, and then assembly wise uh, as a salary basis the, the design engineers will take on that responsibility. That's great, that's great. Um, were you planning on, um, for the 3D printing, um, I know you had some unique materials there. Uh, were you planning on outsourcing any of that or maybe for the prototype here at the university or what were your thoughts on that? Uh, we've been looking at prototyping here at the university. Okay. We would just okay. need to order those specific print materials. And for the final product, it would need a uh, dual extruder printer to print both the support material and the Z-Peak material. Okay. Um, that sounds good. Just as a thought though, for production, I'd wanna make sure those facilities are readily available at the university, see what you'd have to pay for them. Um, I know like over at Infinity Hall, they have a great fabrication lab. Um, they do all kinds of manufacturing. I don't know why it's at Infinity Hall, but they have a great setup. Um, also, you can reach out to some like, third-party manufacturers who you just send your CADs to and they'll 3D print whatever you want in whatever you want. And that might be easier for you guys because you have a lot of room in your budget, um, but it looks really great. Okay, thank you. We'll look into that. All right. Um, I have a question. Can we go to your heat transfer analysis? Absolutely. So we have a heat transfer analysis. And then we also have our thermal cycling test results, if you would like to see that right here. Um, but I can go back to the one that we presented, if you would rather. Yeah, it was um, something that Joel said that I think I may might have misheard or misunderstood. So. Um, All right. Yeah, there, there it is. 
Okay. So, so what I think I heard her say um, was something about you guys are putting coding on and that coding is going to um, like reflect sunlight and therefore facilitate thermal management. Um, is this the equation that uh, tells you about yeah. reflection? This was when doing research, this was the equation that I found to predict how much of the radiation is going to be affecting our actual CSD. So with the coding, that is what's going to be reflected. Plus or minus some error, of course, because not everything's going to be perfect. Is that right? Hmm. I think so. It's... So I, I think that this is this is the equation that that is how much the surface of the CSD is radiating. So not necessarily what it's reflecting, but the energy that it's that it's radiating at uh, T solid, right? That's the surface temperature. Mm -hmm. So um, reflection might be in there somewhere. That that's probably what emissivity is. Well, no, no. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think I think you're what this equation is telling you is is how much total energy you're radiating, but I don't think it isolates just the amount of energy that you're reflecting. All right, we will take a look into that for our uh, final design report. Yeah, that that would be that would be good because I I think I, I I how to put this I think this is the correct equation, but I think your interpretation of it is is not right. Okay. Um, so, and then, and then the other thing that I wanted to ask is, um, 2.7 Kelvin, um, you guys are imagining that you're radiating just out into space. Um, what about the fact that the CSD is sitting inside, a basically the body of a rocket, right? Aren't you actually radiating to, to the, to the walls of the, of the SLS? And is yes. that really at 2.7 Kelvin? We wanted to take into account the largest dis like largest difference in temperatures possible to ensure that we could withstand as much as humanly possible. We took into the account the worst case scenario. Okay, so this is an upper bound on the amount of heat that gets radiated away. Yes. Is that right? Upper bound? Yeah, yeah, upper bound. Because you're, I, I would guess that the temperature inside the SLS is hotter than two point seven Kelvin. So yeah. you're radiating to surfaces that are that are hotter than that. So you'll end up getting a lower difference between those temperatures to the fourth power, and therefore a lower rate of heat transfer. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if that's correct, lower rate of heat transfer doesn't that mean that the temperature is going to be higher than what you've stated here? Like more of the thermal energy that's basically getting dissipated because you guys are, I guess maybe that's a more important, let me, let me start with that. Um, where is the energy coming from, the, the, the thermal energy that's setting the temperature of the wall of the CSD? Uh, when doing research, that was the highest achievable temperature that a launch vehicle inside and out would receive during its mission. Well, yeah, that, that's what I'm asking, right? Like what what sets that temperature? Uh, and and not not from a sense of like, you know what what physical material properties or failure modes set that temperature, but why is that the steady state temperature of the skin of the CSD? we went through and tried to find the highest range possible. So through my research, that is what I was able to find as being the highest temperature possible. Okay, hang on. Let, let, me, let me try this a different way. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm probably not asking the question clearly. Um, will it actually be, will the skin of the CSD actually be nominally 330 Kelvin? Like when, when you actually install it and launch it and it's sitting out there in space, like, is that what you expect that temperature to be? No, but during launch, we want to account the entire time during launch as well. So that is like, we didn't take into account like the temperature that it would actually be as that is most likely going to be 
lower. We wanted to maximize and ensure that we were choosing the greatest range. So that's like 330 Kelvin. That's that's basically like room temperature, right? A little bit hotter than that? Uh, definitely hotter. So, you, well, not not much hotter, but yeah, yeah a little no, bit hotter, not much hotter, but definitely a little hotter. bit hotter than room temperature. So this is this is the highest achievable temperature. Maybe it's the word achievable that's messing me up. It's it's. Am I right in saying that you actually mean tolerable, highest tolerable temperature? Yes, sir. Got it. Okay, highest tolerable temperature, three thirty Kelvin. Okay, well that, that opens up a whole different can of worms that maybe I'll ask you guys offline. But um, okay, so so I, I guess what I'm getting from this is is three thirty three twenty eight. I'm I'm approximating is three thirty three thirty Kelvin um, is the highest temperature that that you could sort of sustain, um, but you could get colder than that, right? Like and still and still function. Yes. I think what Joelle's trying to explain is that um, the T solid um, temperature of 328 Kelvin is what the CSD is going to experience while it's sitting on the launch pad and during launch. While T infinity is the coldest possible uh, temperature that the CSD will experience. And so by doing the, by taking that equation between those two extremes, we can find uh, what our safe operating range is. Uh, okay. Um, so if you guys are, are, are on the ground, um, you know, waiting to launch and the, the surrounding environment is at 328 or 330 Kelvin, um, is, is radiation heat transfer even the right heat transfer mechanism, given that, you know, you're on the ground and surrounded by presumably a, an environment of air, at least until you get up, you know, above the atmosphere. Is that, is this still the, the principal means of heat transfer between the CSD and the launch vehicle? Um, this was conducted to try to achieve the highest possible difference that we are gonna experience. So on the ground, most of the time we are gonna be inside our launch vehicle, if not inside our clean room. So we should not be experiencing any sort of heat transfer that is going to be large enough to affect while we are like on the ground. Hmm. Okay, well, maybe maybe we should have a chat offline because I, um, I, I'm not saying that you guys are, are wrong but there's a lot here that I, I don't really understand why you did why the why you did it the way you did it um so so maybe maybe we can we can chat offline because I, I think i've got a lot more questions than we probably have time for mm -hmm. so um okay so we'll, we'll we'll take that under advisement for a post video chat on on heat transfer analysis um is there um Anyone else from the panel that, that wants to ask anything? Because we, we did just hit sort of the end of our official time. So I also don't want to go too far over. No? Okay. All right. Um, then, then I think that's a good, a good time and place to, to wrap things up. Um, so I want to thank you guys um, for sharing your, your design with us and for giving us a presentation this morning and this afternoon um, since we slid through 12 noon here. Um, and kind of more generally, just thank you for your, your energy and your creativity um, over the course of the semester and, and, you know, for putting up with me and all of my annoying quirks and, and all the things that, that uh, you know, make mech two what john brooks is in here he was in the previous session but john brooks refers to this class as the final boss in the mechanical engineering curriculum so um you know just i appreciate that you guys have, have navigated that and put up with <laughs> everything that makes the class the way that it is to achieve uh what is you know i, I think a, a very good solution 
Um, and hopefully as we move forward into Mech 3, this one will uh, make its way into the house of quality and, and maybe get selected for prototyping. So um, anyway, just want to thank you guys for <coughs> surviving the class. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you very much for um, having us here today. Uh, we appreciate all your instruction throughout the semester. Oh yeah, no, my pleasure. We uh, love, and when I say we, I mean just you know myself and the teaching team. We we love working with you guys and watching you. Um, as I, as I've said a number of times in class, um, making the transition from being engineering students to being practicing engineers, and that's. Um, really what this presentation is about. This is, at least in my mind, uh, for many of you, like that, that first moment where all of a sudden you, you, um, you know, step out of the, out of the nest and um, experience what it's like to be real practicing engineers sometimes for the first time. So uh, we love being part of that process and supporting you guys through it. So thanks for that comment. Um, okay, let me hit the stop button.